In other words, the question, if you're sitting at home right now worried about your job or your business, whatever you worry about, what does the future hold? And that's why this is probably the most important program. See, most people just watch the stock market. That's all they watch. They don't know much about home prices in their neighborhood. And that's not good enough. So our guest today is George Gammon. He takes the ultra complex and puts it in pictures. Even if you don't understand them at first, just keep tracking with them. Because you're going to see what 99.99% of the world's population will never see. What are you seeing in the future, George? What I want to stress, and I'll explain this just momentarily, but what I really want to stress to the viewer is that if you're able to just start to understand the macroeconomic picture, and it doesn't need to be complex. The reason you think it's complex is because all these economists and academics, they use all this jargon and technical terms, but if you just break it down into simple English, it's actually very easy for people to understand. And if they understand it, they're going to be able to make much better better decisions for themselves and their family in the future for their finances. So whether it's me or anyone else, make sure that you're trying to really pay attention to what's going on. Let's just say that you've been saving your money, you've been working hard, you've been doing all the right things, you've got a little nest egg saved up and you go to the bank and you're like, oh my gosh, they're only giving me 0.5 interest or zero or who knows what it is. It's, you can't even see the interest rates. They're so small nowadays. So you say, okay, where can I go to get a little bit higher rate of return? But I still want to be safe. It's got to be safe. So then you might look at a product like a money market mutual fund or a money market fund. And then you look at this, you say, well, that's safe. All my buddies are doing it. It's just like a bank account, but I get maybe a 1.5% return. Well, what the average person doesn't realize is they're taking exponentially more risk just to get that 1% additional return. So how is that? Because the way that the money market mutual fund gets the additional return is they take your hard earned savings and money and they put it into the repo market or they put it into the commercial paper market, which is basically funding for corporations, the same type of thing. So the question then becomes that person that's just watching Monday night football and just enjoying life, you know, with the white picket fence, the two kids, the golden retriever, they don't care about what's going on with the plumbing. They don't care about the dollar swaps, but does that person really want to lend their hard earned savings to Deutsche Bank? to HSBC, you know, some of these banks that could be crumbling as we speak, or to put things into other terms like more America-centric corporate terms, would that individual want their money being lent to American Airlines right now, or Boeing right now, where every single time you turn on CNBC or the TV, you see that they're asking for another bailout because they're about to go bust. That's how this macro and that's how the cash flow and the plumbing that Robert's talking about, that's how just one way that it can affect the everyday person. So if our banks are going bust right now, what does that mean? Well, it's right. not just the banks, it's the government, it's the private sector, it's our entire economy because these debt cycles run in courses of 75 to 100 years. I'm going back to Ray Dalio. Right now, we're at the top of a 75 to 100 year long-term debt cycle. So the only way from here is down. And Robert, you called this in a lot of your books and you kind of predicted this and had the foresight to see this coming. But when you get to the top of one of these debt cycles, the only thing the government can do, well, there's four ways out of it. Number one, they can choose austerity which very few governments do. And that's just tightening the belt, spending less. Everyone feels the pain. Think of the deflation or depression we had in the 1930s. Or they restructure the debt. Not likely we're going to do that with China. It's not likely we're going to do that with the big banks because they're the creditors. Or they could just default, say, hey, we're not paying you. Or what most governments do is they choose money printing. This is creating inflation to bail out all the people who have the debt, whether it's governments, whether it's individuals. So once you get debt to a certain level, you've got to, it, well, you don't have to, but most governments choose to inflate it away. So what does that mean for the average person? Well, if the government is going to try to create inflation, meaning the cost of goods and services going up, what you want to do is you want to make sure that you're positioned for that. So as an example, if you just own your own home, 
you've got to make sure that you've got a 30 year fixed rate mortgage. Because if they try to create inflation, if interest rates go up, then your interest rate is going to go up unless it's fixed. And what happens when you're a debtor and they create inflation, you're going to have the opportunity to pay the loan back, your mortgage, with cheaper devalued dollars. So the way they can think about that is if they borrow, let's say $100,000, the rate of interest means that they're paying the bank back with increased purchasing power because you've got principal plus interest. So what happens in inflation though, is inflation allows the borrower to pay the debt back with less purchasing power. So if your rate of interest, let's say is 1% or 3%, we'll call it, but if inflation goes up to five, 6%, the delta between those two is a transfer of purchasing power from the bank to the individual homeowner. And I think a lot of people listening to this probably have a mortgage, if not on a rental property, on their own home. And I think that's the very first thing they can do to be proactive. Also gold, silver, Bitcoin, you talk about that all the time. We're sitting on this coronavirus, which is yeah. changing everything. What is your crystal ball? What are you seeing? Not your crystal ball because you're studying it and you're seeing all the charts and the numbers. What are we looking at? From an economic standpoint, for the average person, I think they just have to look at the entire economy as supply and demand. So the supply is how much stuff do we produce? How much goods and services? Demand is how much money we have, our willingness, our access to credit to go out and buy the stuff. So as most people know, we're in lockdown, uh, you know, depending on what state you live in, what city. So there's a lot less demand. There's a lot less goods and services that are actually being purchased, right? So that decreases the demand equation. That's what most people get fixated on. So they think, okay, well, we're just, we have to have prices going down, deflation. But they forget about the supply side of the equation because if the people can't go out to produce goods and services, well, the supply will go down fast as well. So then the question becomes, what's going down faster, demand or supply? Well, then you look at the supply chains that have been disrupted coming into the United States. If you go to Walmart, Target, Home Depot, the majority of the stuff you see on the shelves was produced outside of the United States. So if those supply chains get disrupted, that means less supply. Then what happens is usually, going back to Dalio's example of long-term debt cycles, you get social unrest. And I hate to say that, but that's just the reality of the situation if you look at history. And typically the way the politicians take care of social unrest is through helicopter money. So whether you want to call it MMT, UBI, it doesn't matter. It's basically the government spending money into the real economy, getting into the back pockets of the average Joe and Jane. We could see a situation in the future where the Fed is actually doing it. They're not technically allowed to do it right now, but they've been breaking all of the rules. So if there's more money in the pocket of the average person, that means there's more demand, even though they're sitting at home, not going to work, for those goods and services in the economy that don't require debt. That's key, Kim, because people see deflation and inflation as just this, it's, it's binary, right? It's either one or the other, but it's actually very nuanced. So if there's less debt in the system, that means uh, asset prices could go down or via cars, anything that most people buy using debt, okay, the prices of those go down, but anything people buy uh, or most, goods and services people buy on a daily basis that don't require debt, such as groceries, those prices typically go up. And if right. I saw on CNBC the other day that in a lot of markets around the United States, food prices are up as high as 25%. It's already so starting. You can see this yeah. happening in real life. Yeah, what's happening is because of the COVID or whatever they call it, the meat packing companies are shutting down. Yeah, exactly. And so there's now shortages of meat. So great George example said, of supply decreasing faster than demand. But what's happening is that, and the Fed is pumping trillions into the economy. So you have a decreasing supply, increased liquidity. And that's why the shelves are empty for pork and beef and all those things. And uh, Arab Spring, which I don't forget when that happened, but the real rioting wasn't about Muslimism or Christians and all this. Arab Spring was because mom and pop couldn't afford to go to the store. Food prices, prices went so high. 
And I think that's what you're saying is when people get hungry or they can't afford food, that's when the social situation gets worse.